All right, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And let me begin by raising this question. You can just think about it for a moment. In the Old Testament, were the children of Israel justified or were they saved through the keeping of the law? Were they redeemed by keeping the commandments? Uh, another question, did God only care about the Israelites? Well, the answer is no to both. And here in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is going to prove that even before the law was given at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus, you have people being justified, not by the law, but through faith. We just saw that in the scripture reading of Genesis 15. So the Judaizers, the false teachers, were teaching that salvation came through the law. What about before the law was even given? What about uh, the non uh, Israelites who, who did not have the covenant. Uh, so there's a, a lot of false uh, assumptions in their doctrine. Look at Galatians 3 verse 8. Galatians 3 8 says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So in that verse, you have scripture personified. So it's the scripture that's preaching the gospel to who? Who's the gospel being preached to? Abraham. Abraham. Now that might be a, a new thought, that the gospel was preached to Abraham. And, and someone might think to themselves, well, wait a minute, I thought the gospel was a New Testament thing. Well, is salvation only a New Testament thing? Were people not saved in the Old Testament? Well, therefore, the gospel cannot be exclusive to the New Testament. Do you know when the gospel is first introduced in the Bible? It's not explicit. It's not crystal clear. But the gospel first appears in Genesis chapter 3. Because that's when sin first makes an appearance. As soon as sin enters the picture, the promise of the Savior and the gospel enters the picture. And back in Genesis, there were no Jews. There was no uh, nation of, of Israel. And all of this is, is going to help prove Paul's Point. Now today we have, we have the fullness of the gospel. Whatever gospel was preached to Abraham, we're going to look at that. Uh, whatever gospel was there in the Old Testament, today we have the fullness of the gospel. We know the ins and the outs, or hopefully we do. Uh, but back then they had very little information. But a person was saved by believing even that little bit of information that God Gave. Over time, God revealed more and more truth. Uh, but it's made clear Abraham was justified by what? By his faith. Another thing, Abraham at this point in time was not even circumcised. And of course, that's what the Judaizers were teaching in the churches of Galatia, that you need to be circumcised to be saved. Well, Abraham wasn't circumcised, and here he is saved in Genesis chapter 15. So it's important to kind of know all of that uh, because that's the argument that Paul is putting forth. And it's also important to notice that even back in Genesis, there is this statement, in you, Abraham, all the nations shall be blessed. God cares more about uh, just one ethnic group out in the wilderness. It's God so loves, God so loved what? The world. The world. So I've titled this message, And All the Nations Shall Be Blessed. That's not exactly uh, happening right now. If you look around, you can't say that all the nations are being blessed at this moment. But all the nations have been blessed to a degree. And where does the blessing come from? Christ. And every nation one day will be blessed when Christ rules and reigns upon the earth. So that's all background. Let's start reading Galatians chapter 3 starting in verse 6. Paul writes, just as Abraham believed God 
and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which were written in the book of the law and do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. That's an Old Testament quotation of Habakkuk 2 verse 4. Yet the law, Paul says, is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. A reference to the cross. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And may the Lord add a blessing through the reading of his word. So a simple way to look at what the Judaizers were doing, they were telling Christians that, hey, your faith is not enough. I know you believe in Jesus. I know you have faith in Jesus, but your faith isn't enough. You need more. Basically, they were saying, I mean, essentially, you need to become Jewish in order to be a true Christian. You need to be part of, of our group in order to be saved. In particular, the issue was what? You had to be circumcised in order to be saved. Uh, so uh, that, that was a kind of a controversial thing. Um, you can imagine, uh, if you think about it, um, that, that's not really something that uh, adult men would want to go through. Right? So their attitude, the, the Judaizers, the Gentiles in Galatia, they looked at the Gentiles as dogs. Okay, understand this. A Jew back 2,000 years ago, I'm not saying all of them, but it was very common, they would look at a non Jewish person as you're a dog. You need to become Jewish, you need to become uh, one of us in order for you to be anything. And in order to become one of us, you need to be circumcised. So just a quick overview from last week, Paul writing to this group of churches in the Roman province of Galatia, which would be uh, modern day uh, Turkey, the nation of Turkey. Uh, the majority of people in these churches were Gentile converts to Christ. Uh, these people most of them were not Jewish. They were Gentile Christians. Uh, the Apostle Paul was Jewish, ethnically. Of course, years earlier, when Paul was a devout Jew religiously, he was known as who? What was his? Saul, right, Saul of Tarsus. And it's interesting, back then when Paul was trying to justify himself through the works of the law, what was he? He was an enemy of God. He was an enemy of the church. He was a persecutor of the church because he was trying to justify himself through a, a false gospel, basically. So Paul, being on both sides of the issue, Paul has a unique perspective. Uh, I think Paul understands all of this like nobody else. Uh, sometimes we read the writings of the Apostle Paul you know this is true. You would have to admit it. You read the epistles of Paul and you scratch your head. I don't even know what he's talking about sometimes, right? Well, you're in good company. The apostle Peter basically said the same thing. Talked about our brother Paul and that is writing. Some of the things are hard to understand. So I think Paul is operating on a deeper level. So we're trying to understand what, uh, what he's getting at. So what's happening? Uh, why is Paul so concerned uh, about these churches? Why is there such passion and urgency? And you know, when we're talking about the Lord, there should be passion. 
uh, there should be, especially with salvation, there should be a, a sense of urgency. Uh, Paul felt responsible for these churches because, well, he was responsible. Uh, these churches were established through the preaching uh, from Paul of the true gospel, which is salvation by grace through faith. That's grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone. But unfortunately, what had happened, the false teachers had come in and they started preaching a different message that you needed to keep the law. Yeah, you need to believe in Jesus, but you also have to do this. You have to believe in Jesus, but you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And unfortunately, a lot of the people were buying into it. So what does that mean? They were falling away from the truth. They heard the truth from Paul. They heard the message from the Judaizers. They believed Paul. Now they're starting to come in the other direction. They are falling away from the true gospel. And we had said last week that the Judaizers were what? What kind of false teachers were they? It begins with an L. Yeah, they, were, they practiced legalism. So the false teachers were legalists. Salvation through the law of Moses. And it's really sad because you know what the purpose of the law is? It's supposed to drive you to the cross. When you read the commandments, you know in your heart, I've broken this. I violated this one. Maybe I haven't done that, but I felt like it. So you, that should all drive you to the cross. But instead, the Judaizers are just focusing on law, keeping rules. You know, you're saved by doing this, this, and this. So the Judaizers, think of the word, they were Jewish, right? Jewish, Judaizer. They're trying to get people to be Jewish, bring them under the law. So the Judaizers were circumcised. The Galatian men were not. Why? Because they saw no need for it. Circumcision is not part of the New Testament gospel. Uh, it was really a non-issue, just like really it's, it's a non-issue today. Doesn't, doesn't matter. But then the Judaizers came and they said, hey, you're not circumcised? You're not even saved. You're not even a Christian. That's maybe hard for us to wrap our minds around. That's what's happening. And they were starting to convince people. The people were starting to, to listen to them. So the false teachers were having quite an impact. This was causing massive division in the church. And don't you know that's how division comes into a church? Sometimes churches divide over dumb things like, hey, we're replacing the carpet. What, what color are we going to do, red or blue? And people get all, I've heard of that happening. Uh, but oftentimes... Uh, division comes into a church through false doctrine. A guy comes into a church, or maybe he's been there a long time, and then he starts, starts preaching things that are not true. Uh, and then people naturally get upset, and they point it out. That's not right. And well, I'm, the, I'm the man of God here, and it, it just causes division. So that's how false teachers operate. Jesus says they are wolves in sheep's clothing. They devour the flock through the teaching of sound doctrine. And maybe one of the worst things about it, the faithful man who comes along and says, that's not true. He gets blamed as being the one who causes the division when it's actually the opposite. So that's how, that's how it works. So circumcision... This really isn't an issue today, uh, but we have other issues in the church today. Churches today are dividing over things like social justice, so-called alternative lifestyles, uh, prosperity gospel. Even the whole COVID situation has divided uh, many, many churches. Uh, so we want to be aware uh, of the danger. So we want to have grace, and we always want to be biblical. We always want to be biblical. What does the scripture say? So those are some of the current issues, uh, but what about back then? It was over this matter of circumcision. What's at stake here? Say, so, well, circumcision isn't a big deal. Well, if you're at, trying to add it to the gospel, it is a big deal. Anything can be a big deal if we say, hey, you're not saved unless you do this. 
you're not saved unless you stop eating pork. Well, that sounds ridiculous to you. But you know, there's some people who believe that. If you eat pork, you're going to hell. There's some people who believe that. So the truth is at stake. Churches are at stake. Who is going to have the preeminence? Is Jesus Christ going to have the preeminence? Or is some social movement going to have the preeminence? The Judaizers, what they were doing, they were trying to wrestle authority away from the apostles. Who are you going to listen to? Paul or them? Who are you going to listen to today? Uh, the truth from the word of God or what's popular? This is a consistent issue throughout uh, the history of the church. Here's why it was especially dangerous back then. Because the Judaizers had some victories, didn't they? Who was the man that the Judaizers brought onto their side for a little while? Or that's the way it looked. The Judaizers even got Peter to compromise. And they claimed that the apostle James, James is on our side too. Now, I don't think that was the case. But you can see how in Paul's mind, hey, they got Peter to compromise, James, we don't know what's going on there. You can see how Paul would be really worried or Paul would be really um, on top of this. To him, potentially everything is at risk. I've heard this before and maybe some, maybe some people here have said it because um, Paul is very direct. Have you heard someone say this? Well, I don't see why Paul has to be so abrasive. If you heard something like that. But why, why does Paul have to say this? Why does Paul have to put it that way? It just seems a little harsh. Paul isn't the problem. <laughs> All right? Paul is not the problem. Essentially, he is at war. This is a spiritual war over the souls of men. And it's a spiritual battle over the most important institution on earth. Institution, for lack of a better term. What am I talking about? the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what's at stake. Now we know, well, the, the, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Uh, that's true. But local churches can be at risk. People's souls can be at risk. Uh, governments are set up. Governments collapse. Colleges and universities will come and go. Uh, other institutions will rise up and, and crumble. But the church of Jesus Christ endures forever. Amen. So Paul knows the church isn't going to cease to exist, but local churches might. Uh, the redeemed will be saved, but individuals might be lost. So hopefully that helps you to realize what's at stake and why Paul is so zealous. So here's the point to remember, okay? The Judaizers were ministers of Satan. Now does that seem harsh? Now, there's some people, let's face it, that seems harsh. They were ministers of Satan. Uh, Paul uses that exact term in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's the most sinister part about it, though. They profess the name of Christ. The false teachers, ministers of Satan, they preached about Jesus. They talked about Jesus. False teachers are not people teaching other religions. False teachers are those who creep into churches and they give lip service to the name of Christ. Paul says they preach another Christ, they preach another gospel, it causes people to receive a, a different spirit. But do you see how dangerous this can be? I mean, I would love to get up and every Sunday and just preach about how, hey, listen, everything is so wonderful. Everything is so great, and you know, things are, things are good oftentimes. Jude wanted to do that. He wanted to write an epistle about their common salvation, but he understood what was going on at the moment and what was at stake. Paul, same thing. Just uh, one more point on this idea of false teachers as ministers of, of Satan. I said they talk about Jesus. Do you remember when the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness? What did he do? The devil came quoting Bible verses. Now he twisted them and took them out of context. The Judaizers were doing the same, but Satan is so subtle. 
He knows what he is doing. You get into an argument with the devil, you will lose. So Christians cannot afford to be gullible. We cannot afford to be unaware. Uh, we need to be sober, the Bible says, be vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, what? He walketh about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So Christians then and now need to be discerning. We need to be walking with the Lord in our personal lives. If, if you're not walking with the Lord Monday through Saturday, the devil can pick you off. Uh, he can have those victories during the week. We need to be walking with the Lord. But I said we need discernment. This is a great quote. If you take notes, write this down. This is one of the best quotes I've ever heard uh, that's come out of the last century or two. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, discernment is not knowing right from wrong. Discernment is knowing right from almost right. Let me repeat that. Discernment is not knowing right from wrong. Discernment is knowing right from almost right. If you don't get that, you can come up to me afterward and ask. It, it's easy to tell the difference between right and wrong. But what about right and almost right? Like I, I heard this preaching, I heard this sermon. It's, it sounded right. He's talking about Jesus. The Judaizers believed that Jesus died and rose again. But they are false teachers. It sounded right. Oftentimes, it's what the preacher isn't saying. Everything he says is right. It's what he left out. That's another problem. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Just as Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So the battle is over the true gospel. Is it salvation in Christ alone, faith alone, or is it faith plus works? That's the, the battle. Verse 8 in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So let's compare scripture with scripture and go back to the book of Genesis, if you would. So turn to Genesis chapter 15. We read this for the scripture reading. We'll go through it a little more uh, in depth. Uh, in depth. Genesis 15. And then we'll go back and look at Genesis chapter 12. But remember, this, this is long before the Ten Commandments were ever given. This is hundreds of years before the Old Covenant law was delivered at Mount Sinai. Abraham was saved here in Genesis 15. Maybe earlier, you could argue, but he was definitely saved by this point in time. Therefore, salvation cannot come through the law. Law hasn't even been given yet. Salvation comes through the promise. Okay? A person is saved. A person is justified before God. A person goes to heaven and receives everlasting life by simply believing in God's promise. The law is the law. The promise, however, is gospel. Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So while Abraham didn't have a Bible, did he have the word of God? Well, yeah, because God, God was talking to him. And the words that God spoke became part of of the scripture and we're reading that now verse 2 but Abram said Lord God what will you give me seeing I go childless in the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus then Abraham said look you have given me no offspring indeed one born in my house is my heir and back then it's not unlike today having children is very important to people Right? You kind of carry on that family line. Having children is so 
important, especially back then for a wealthy, powerful man. Abraham had everything he needed and then some. Very wealthy, very, he was like a prince of the land, so to speak. But you know, the one thing he wanted the most, he didn't have. He wanted an heir. He wanted a child. He wanted a son. Look at verse 4. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one, that is his servant, Eliezer, he shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then the Lord brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Of course, Abraham was an old man. His wife is far beyond the age of childbearing. She's barren anyways. So what God is promising, remember, it's a promise. What God is promising, it really is impossible, right? What God is promising is impossible. Sort of like the angel Gabriel who came to Mary, a virgin, and said, you are going to conceive as a virgin. Guess what? That's not possible. Yet they believed. It's sort of like the Lord telling us, those who believe, though they die, yet shall they live. People die. The promise of God is that they shall rise again. Amen. That's impossible. Not with faith. Not with God. Because with God, all things are possible. Creating the universe out of nothing, just by speaking the word, speaking the creation, that's impossible, but not for God. So it's about believing the word of God. It's about believing God's promise. And what's Abraham's reaction? Verse 6 says, Abraham believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. What, what is this? Sola fide, faith alone. The gospel is salvation by faith alone. Abraham didn't have to be circumcised to be saved. He didn't have to do all these good works to be saved. He was saved by believing the promise of God. All right, now let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. And this is one of the points that Paul is making in Galatians. And again, remember that Gentile salvation was kind of a controversial uh, thing. Now, obviously, back then, the, the men in Galatia were were, um, they were not Jewish, they, they wouldn't have been circumcised. Telling someone they had to be circumcised to be saved was a stumbling block. They, they were not inclined to do that for obvious reasons. So that's a, that was one controversy. Uh, but the whole idea of a Gentile coming to salvation to begin with, for the Jews, that was scandalous. Hey, only the Jews are saved. That's the way they thought. Only the Jews are saved. Well, you know, the Bible says that salvation is of the Jews. It doesn't say it's only for the Jews. How many of you have read the, the book of Jonah? Didn't God care about the, the city of Nineveh and, and all those people and they repented? If you go through the Bible, God cares, even back then, about other people too, not just the Israelites. So the, the Judaizers were way off base uh, in many ways. God so loved the people of the, the whole world, right? John 3, 16, God so loved the world. 1 John 2, 2, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only. This is a Jew writing this. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for Gentiles as well. The Greek word translated world is cosmos, and in this context, it refers to humanity in general or the Gentiles as contrasted to the Jews. So in other words, God loves everyone. You know, we can say that. God loves everyone. Jews can be saved. Non-Jews can be saved. People who are born from Christian parents can be saved. People who are born from non-Christian parents can be saved. Black, white, male, female, rich, poor, Anyone can be saved. So, well, you don't know what I've done in the past. Well, God knows, and he says you can be saved if you will come to faith 
in Christ. You know how the world wants to pit people against each other, right? You know, the identity groups, this group, you know, male and female against each other, black and white against each other, rich and poor against each other. What does the Lord want to do? The Lord wants to bring everybody together in unity in his church. There is one condition, though, repentance and faith in Christ. Amen. And what is repentance? Maybe, maybe someone listening is new to all of this. What does a person have to do? You have to repent. Repent means a turning or a change of mind. It's one action, faith in repentance. You, you are trusting in this. You are living for yourself, um, walking in the ways of the world. You change your mind about sin and you turn. So you turn from sin to Christ. You are trusting in whatever it was. and you're, It's one motion, turning to Christ, faith in Christ. And once you do that, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus saves a person, not what they do or how much money they give or how many good things or how nice they are. Well, that may be important. There's something to be said about all those things. But it's faith alone that saves. And once a person comes to faith, then what? There's the sanctifying work of the Holy Ghost. Hey, listen, I know it's, uh, I only got three minutes, but you don't have anywhere to go, right? <laughs> hey, 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 I don't want to lose you here. A few more minutes. Hang on. This is important stuff. Isn't it? Isn't salvation important? Isn't sanctification important? Well, I already know. I've heard all this. I already know all this. Well, then this is a refresher so you can go tell somebody later on today or tomorrow. Believers are said to be predestined to, the, to be conformed to the image of Christ. So once you believe, you are to grow and become more like Jesus. I mean, that's how you know if the Holy Spirit is at work in you that you are conformed to be more like Jesus. Jesus. You know, that's the gospel that we preach. That's the gospel that Paul preached. And here's the good news. It's available for all. It's available for everyone. And here's the thing. It was always that way. It was always that way from the beginning. The problem was over time, and we're almost done, but over time, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, Jacob had his name changed to Israel. The children of Israel, over time, they, be, they became puffed up. Hey, we're, we are more important. We are special. Well, they were special. That's true. But the key is, do you have faith in the Lord? That's what it's all about. Do you personally have faith in the Lord? You know, Abraham was originally, we, we, have we read it yet? Genesis chapter 12. Are you in Genesis 12? Okay, what's he called there? Abraham. Yeah, he's not called Abraham, he's called Abram. You know what Abram means? It means father. Father. But then the Lord changed his name to Abraham, which means father of many nations. The point is, blessing came through faith in the promise. It's about believing, not the bloodline. It's not about the bloodline. Bloodline was important. It was very important. But it's about believing. Abraham's the father of many nations, not just Israel, not just the Jews. Salvation is available to all, not just Jews. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And he certainly did that. And you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And here is the gospel that Paul said was preached to Abraham. The Lord says, and in you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham became known as the father of the faithful. If you have faith in the Lord today, you are, in a sense, spiritually a descendant of Abraham. You are a child of Abraham. Why? Because you share the faith 
of Abraham. You are in that same line. Abraham is the example for us all. When God told Abraham something incredible, look up at the night sky. So shall your descendants be. When he told him that, you know, Abraham didn't argue with God. He didn't have doubts. He simply believed. Okay, God said it. That's true. It's, it's that simple. God said it. That's true. All right, now turn back to Galatians chapter 3 and uh, we'll close there, okay? I, I really mean it this time. <laughs> I have so much to say, so little time. So nobody is saved through their good works. If you think you're going to heaven because you're a good person, you know, you, you don't understand the gospel. And I know that 90% of you or 100% of you, Lord willing, know that. But this is what we need to constantly be uh, affirming and teaching people because the majority of professing Christians in this world, the majority of people in this world believe that you go to heaven because you're a nice person. That's just inherent to people, it seems. So the children of Israel were not justified through keeping the law because nobody ever has except one. Christ who fulfilled the law. Galatians 3.10 For as many as were of the works or of the works of the law are under what? Oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm saved because I'm, I've done this and I've done that. Oh, I, I'm going to heaven because I, I'm a good person. You know what you're doing? You're putting yourself back under the law. You might as well say, I'm cursed. Because you're not fooling God. Well, I'm a good person. Well, the thing is, God knows that's not true. And you can fool somebody else. You can't fool God. So I'll, I'll end here. I, again, I have, I have so much to say, I don't have time. Go ahead. But let me close with this point. Be honest with God. Amen. You know, when you pray later on, on the way home tonight, just be honest with God. He already knows. There, there's nothing to hide. Be honest with the Lord and talk to the Lord about your relationship with Him. And some of the things we looked at, salvation by faith. Make sure you're not trusting in anything else or anybody else. Be honest with God. Amen? Amen. All right, let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is so rich. And uh, we could spend all afternoon uh, going from one passage, comparing it with another. Uh, it's so important. And Paul, as as we said, is kind of operating on a different level. Um, we can only scratch the surface. And that's really a wonderful thing because no matter how much we think we know, there's so much more that we don't know. And we, and we almost live for those moments where that little light goes off and we see something. I've, I've never noticed that before. Or it's applied to our heart in such a way that we're going to need later uh, today and through the week. Help us to be faithful uh, because Christ uh, is faithful. Lord, you are faithful. Keep and preserve your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.